Narrative recapped here. Today I'm going to show you a thriller film called Zodiac. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. The year is 1969 in Vallejo, California. After a half-hearted drive to the diner, Darlene Farron and Michael Maju decide to spend their 4th of July near a forest. It was gearing to be an awkwardly romantic evening for the two until a group of teenagers started throwing firecrackers at their car. Michael curses the group as they drive off and this endears Darlene to him even more. Suddenly, a new car pulls over from a distance, making them grow wary. The car drives away and they start to calm down but eventually, the vehicle circles back behind them. The pair's nervousness only grew when a man stepped out to point a flashlight at them. Thinking it would be a robbery, Michael tells Darlene to take her wallet out. Before they could react, the man pulls out a gun and begins firing at them. Darlene is shot repeatedly, fatally injuring her. The murderer calls the police and reports the location of his victims, before ending the call by announcing that he killed the kids from last year. With that, he bid the police goodbye. Four weeks later, the news publisher San Francisco Chronicle receives a direct letter from the self-proclaimed killer. In the letter, he claims that he killed the two teenagers along with another girl last 4th of July. To prove that he isn't bluffing, he wrote facts that only the killer and the police would know. The letter also contained a cipher that split into three parts, with the other two parts sent to Vallejo Times and SF Examiner. The killer demands these companies to print the coded messages containing his identity to the front page of their papers. He threatens to kill a dozen people should they ignore him. The newspaper editors hold a meeting to discuss whether they'll comply with the killer's request or not. One of the members of the discussion is Robert Graysmith, the paper's cartoonist. He is handed the coded message then writes down the symbols on a piece of paper. The editorial team wants to confirm with Paul Avery if the events that the killer reported were actually true. Paul is their local writer who covers crimes in Vallejo so he's able to call the Vallejo Police Department and then them, he's able to confirm the shootings. The editors decide to run with the killer's demands but they opted to print the code on the fourth page instead. While most of the team leaves to go to a bar, Robert decides to come home with his young son. Once home, he pins the killer's cipher on his wall. All three parts of the cipher are now in circulation and several people are working to crack the code, including Skaggs Island Naval Intelligence Center, the FBI, and the CIA. Among those interested in the code are history teacher Donald Harden and his wife, Betty. Back in the San Francisco Chronicle, Paul acquaints himself with Robert. He shows him the cipher which was successfully decoded by Donald and Betty. Robert reads out the message and Paul mentions that there are still some leftover letters scrambled at the bottom. While Robert ponders over what they could possibly mean, Paul leaves him to think. The editorial calls Paul, and they inform him that the killer sent in another letter about his killings. What's more is that they finally have a name to call the killer by. He introduced himself as Zodiac. Back at the San Francisco Chronicle, Robert discovers another clue related to the Zodiac. The people of the city are growing increasingly unsettled and on one such night, a cab driver is killed. Police officers Bill and David arrive at the scene of the crime and they try to pin down what could have happened. After further analysis, David decides to speak with some children who saw the Zodiac from a window. Three days later, Inspector David and Bill make their way to the San Francisco Chronicle to speak with the editors. During that time, the company receives their next letter from the Zodiac along with a worrying piece of item, the bloodstained shirt worn by the cab driver. In the letter, the Zodiac claims the murder of the driver, along with the Vallejo and Napa killings. But most unnerving of all is the killer's written threat to murder innocent school children. This prompts the editors to publish the killer's story. The following day, Robert couldn't help but worry deeply for his preschooler son. He stops his son from boarding his school bus at the last minute and decides to drive him to school instead. Bill and David have resolved to go fully public with the Zodiac's threat against the children so they can effectively warn people of the possible danger. Several hundred reports come flying in and with the press breathing down their necks, the police are struggling to narrow down the truth. Bill tries to coordinate with the departments in Vallejo and Napa. He discovers that the killer wore boots used solely by military personnel. Just then, two police officers enter the room and they report to Bill and David that they saw the killer on the night when the cab driver was shot. The two of them confirm what the man looked like but they didn't think to stop him because according to their orders, the suspect was an African-American adult male. The profile of the suspect is later corrected to be Caucasian. In the middle of the night, the police receive a call from someone claiming to be the killer. The killer demands to be featured on a talk show and the police readily complies to trace the call. The show begins and the Zodiac makes his next call, telling them to meet him on the top of Fairmont Hotel. Inspector David sends a team to the location immediately but before they can trace the call, the Zodiac hangs up. 
The host assures him and promises that no one's tracing their conversation. This seems to convince the Zodiac and he rings them up again. He talks about his never-ending headaches, about how he only ever gets them to stop when he kills people. The host pleads with the killer to meet him, and the Zodiac demands they meet in front of a thrift store in Daly City. Both the host and the police arrive at the Zodiac's specified location. Back in the television studio, however, the police confirmed with one of the victims that the caller was a fraud. It wasn't the Zodiac as he had a different voice. The call tracing came in and they find out that the call was made from a mental institution. Back at the Chronicle, they receive another letter from the killer. It contains both a cipher and a damning recipe for a bomb. To discuss their new coded message, Paul and Robert go out together for some drinks. The killer sends a letter to the TV host. Bill and David pay him a visit to question him but they conclude that the letter may not be noteworthy. Meanwhile, a woman with her baby is driving along a highway near Modesto. She stopped by a loud honking coming from the car behind her. The man informs her that her right tire is loose and even offers to help. She accepts, then tries to run her car when he was finished, only to have the wheel lop off. Seeing her predicament, the man drives back and offers to take her to the nearest gas station. As she settles in the passenger seat, the man comments that he didn't know she had a baby with her. In the middle of the drive, the woman tries to soothe her crying child and that's when the man calmly tells her that he'll throw the baby out of the window before killing her. A while later, the same woman is seen in the middle of the road, having jumped out of the car's window with her baby. Some time has passed and several letters claiming to be from the Zodiac killer are coming in. Paul tells Robert that the Zodiac is claiming crimes that aren't his own and he starts to theorize that he just wants attention from the press. At present, they can only confirm five of the 13 murders being attributed to him. Paul then shows Robert the watch brand that the Zodiac took his name and logo from. One morning, Paul receives a nice holiday card from the Zodiac and this time, it's directly addressed to him. Dave suggests that he must have aggravated the Zodiac at some point by calling him a latent homosexual in one of his articles about the killer. Later on, many people are beginning to wear I am not Paul Avery pins to avert the threat of the Zodiac killer. With his life under direct threat, Paul buys himself a gun. An anonymous tip then comes in, asking for Paul to come to Riverside, LA. That same evening, Robert goes on a date with a woman named Melanie. She asks about his job, prompting Robert to explain the current situation with Paul and the Zodiac killer. This gets Melanie thinking and she suspects that since it was an anonymous tip, the call could be from the Zodiac killer himself. Melanie helps Robert realize that this may turn into an ambush so he goes to a phone booth to call Paul's wife. A call later comes in from Paul himself, and he has some interesting findings. He reports that the Riverside experts discovered that the single unsolved homicide case in Riverside's history was not only done by the Zodiac killer himself, but it was also his first murder. According to Paul, the handwriting matches the other letters they've been receiving. Paul hands the information directly to the press instead of running it through with the police. This angers Dave. A few days pass and Dave along with the other members of the police force have made their way to Riverside to discuss the evidence and details they had on the alleged first Zodiac case. With the public unrest that Paul had caused, the police are being bombarded with people claiming to either be the Zodiac or a witness. One of the many probable suspects is Arthur Lee Allen, who his former colleagues reported to the police. Dave and Bill follow the lead to track Lee down. They first arrive at his place of work to speak with him and during his impromptu questioning, the pair noticed some suspicious things about the man. He had many telling signs, from the Zodiac branded watch and his knowledge of the book, The Most Dangerous Game. This was referenced in one of the killer's many letters. Lee's shaping up to be an attractive suspect so the police decide to investigate further. Bill and Dave tried to procure a search warrant for Lee's house but their request was disapproved due to insufficient evidence. They try to build their evidence against him with the help of a handwriting analyst, a psychologist for an expert witness, and Lee's former co-worker Cheney. As soon as they get their search warrant, the police head straight for Lee's trailer but by the time they got there, he wasn't home. After a search of the house, the police find Lee driving back towards his trailer. But back in the police station, forensics couldn't find a match on Lee or the Zodiac. Left with no other substantial suspect, this leaves the team incredibly frustrated. Four years have passed and by this point, most people have moved on from the Zodiac case. Bill left the force and Paul quit the San Francisco Chronicle. Robert, however, is still fixated with it. He visits Paul to encourage him to write a book about the Zodiac Killer. After all, no one knows the story as much as he does. Paul dismisses his idea, finding it to be meaningless and when Robert insists that the case is still important, Paul gets mad at him. He doesn't need Robert to invigorate his sense of purpose and when Robert refuses to let it go, he berates him. 
Though Robert didn't find any success with Paul, he doesn't give up. He pays Dave a visit in the police station to try and convince him to start the search again. Robert shows him a lead that he got from the Zodiac's very first cipher. This impresses Dave so he sends Robert to the police officer in Napa to Ken Narlo and then to Jack Molinax in Vallejo. Jack gives Robert access to his case files along with all the evidences on the condition that he doesn't write anything down. Robert continues tirelessly with his search until a man named Wallace Penny calls him on the phone. He claims that the Zodiac killer goes by the name of Rick Marshall, then hangs up. Robert gets the help of several people from the police force and continues to gather information to bring him closer to solving the impossible case. Thanks to Wallace, Robert gets his hands on Rick Marshall's handwriting sample. He sends the sample in for analysis and with the Zodiac case's original handwriting analyst, Robert concludes that the handwriting is the closest match they've ever had. A new Zodiac letter arrives at the San Francisco Chronicle which mentions David specifically. Because of some rumors circulated by a news writer, David was accused of writing the Zodiac letter himself as a publicity stunt then lost his job at the force. David gives up the hunt for Zodiac but Robert continues to be consumed by the hunt much to the disappointment of his wife. Robert meets up with Bob Vaughn, the man Wallace Penny says is a friend of the Zodiacs. Bob leads Robert to his house and after a brief conversation, Robert finds out that it wasn't Rick's handwriting on the sample but Bob's. Bob leads Robert to the basement and the realization starts sinking in. When Robert finds out that Bob participated in the Zodiac killings, he tries to escape but the door was locked. Strangely, Bob allows Robert to leave and unlocks the door. Robert later speaks with Linda, the sister of one of the Zodiac's victims. Linda tells him about a painting party that her sister threw. Several people attended, including a strange man in a suit who sat in a chair the entire night and didn't say a word. Her sister was scared of him and a few weeks after that she was killed. Much to Robert's surprise, she says that the man's name was Lee. Robert knocks on David's door, ready to tell him about his discoveries. He was hesitant to listen to Robert at first but after hearing Lee's name, David is all ears. The two of them start working on the case together and Robert wants to go forward and make this a matter of official police investigation. David shoots the idea down, telling him that they don't have the evidence to back their speculations up. Many years later, Robert finishes his book on the Zodiac Killer. The police set a meeting with Michael Maju who survived the Zodiac Killer's attack. The police officer shows him several photos of potential suspects and Meiju identifies Lee, confirming that he was the one who shot him. Following Mike Meiju's identification of Arthur Lee Allen, authorities scheduled a meeting to discuss charging him with the murders. Lee suffered a fatal heart attack before this meeting could take place. In 2002, a partial DNA profile, that did not match Allen, was developed from a 33-year-old Zodiac envelope. Investigators in San Francisco and Vallejo refused to rule out Allen as a suspect on the basis of this test. In 2004, the San Francisco Police Department deactivated their Zodiac investigation. Today, the case remains open in Napa County, Solano County, and in the city of Vallejo where Arthur Lee Allen is still the prime and only suspect. Inspector David Toski retired from the San Francisco Police Department in 1989. His name was cleared, and he was free from the false charges against him. Paul Avery passed away on December 10, 2000 due to pulmonary emphysema. He was 66. His ashes were scattered by his family in San Francisco Bay. Robert Graysmith lives in San Francisco and enjoys a healthy relationship with his children. He claims he has not received a single anonymous call since Alan's death. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like as it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.